Welcome to episode 24 of Blackhawks Banter, brought to you by the Hockey Writers. Uh, fortunately, our starting lineup snuck through the trade deadline unscathed. My name is Sean Filippelli, and I'll be your host. Joining me tonight will be Greg Boyson, Gail Kachuk, and Brooke Laferno. How's everyone doing? Good. Doing good. Good, good. For those just tuning in, thank you for being here, and please be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel, like our Facebook page, and follow us on Twitter, so you're among the first to catch every new episode when they drop. You can also read all of our work at thehockeywriters.com, and you can find all of our links in the description below. With lots to unpack, let's get right into it. Looking at last week, despite a loss to the Red Wings midweek, the Hawks still went 2-1-0 and, oh, and captured four of a possible six points. Hey. Some new faces joined the roster, so there was some lineup shuffling, and there's a playoff race heating up and on the go. There's a multitude of storylines to follow from last week. With that said, it was Brooks' turn to choose our Blackhawk Star of the Week, highlighting the player that stood out for all the right reasons. So, Brooke, the floor is yours to tell us who you picked and why. So, I feel like these stars of the week are getting harder because it's not exactly like the Hawks have been playing great lately and everyone's, like, really going and it's hard to pick. But it really is hard to pick. I think it's more about picking moments. And so, my star of the week is Vinny Hinestroza. I think the game against Detroit um, – yesterday on Saturday was probably the best game he's had here. I mean, he's only played in six games, but that was the best one he had. He had, they scored four goals yesterday and he assisted on three of them. I mean, that guy is on a tear right now. And I really love it, especially that first goal he had when he connected with Patrick Kane. At first I was mad because he didn't shoot the puck. He was right there. I was like, okay, that was a missed opportunity. And then he just passed it to Kane and that was great. So I pick him. I hope that he continues this because he's been really good at assisting people. He had two assists before that. And so now he has five points in six games here. I think it is. So I love it. He's my star of the week. That's a solid pick. And for every reason you know it, I don't know if any of you caught the the slow-mo of that pass to Patrick Kane, but when you watch on repeat, that was uh, quite a play. I I don't know how he made that happen, but uh, the fact that he did was impressive. Uh, On that note, let's play a journalist here. And I want to give us all the floor to ask Brooke some questions and, and pepper her with why she chose Vinny. So, uh, Greg, let's go with a follow-up uh, to Brooke on why she made that pick. Should I get my recorder out here? And just be, <laughs> um, <laughs> no, I think that's a very good pick. Um, as you said, Brooke, there was it th- becoming a little harder every week to, to pick these just because it's kind of a blob of meh for most of the time. So, <laughs> But it makes it easier for somebody to really stick out, which I think Hinnestroza did. So, um, you know, I, I just – is it, is it a product of playing with Patrick Kane that's this, this giving him this success or is it something else? Uh, what do you, what do you think he's, why he's been so good since he came back? Um, I actually do think it's a product of playing with Patrick Kane. I mean, Patrick Kane makes everyone look good, but also he was playing with Kubelik and he was doing really well with him too. So I honestly do think it's a product of line mates, someone who can actually score on the passes that he gives. But also I do think it's a lot of mentality too. He got traded. It's a fresh start. It's his hometown. He's really playing for a lot and he's playing for a new contract. So, but I do think playing with Patrick Kane definitely helps. If he wasn't playing with him or someone like Kubelik, I don't really know how it would turn out. That's for sure. You definitely, in order to get assist, you got to be playing with goal scorers. That's simple math. Yeah. Simple hockey too. Gail, follow up for Brooke. All right. Well, so along that same line, I think it was at the end of the first period when that happened, it was like 20 seconds left when they scored that awesome goal. And then um, the second and third period, they actually changed up the line. So I want to say it was Hinestroza, Suter and Kane. Um, Would you, would you encourage that going forward and, you know, kind of where all all the other lines would shake out as well? Do you think that that's a good combination to keep them together? Um, I actually really wasn't a fan of that line and I understood that they like connected for that goal, but I just don't think Vinny's a second line player. I think he works a lot better on the third and fourth lines, which is great for him. I'm not even saying that's a knock, but that probably wouldn't be my first choice, but I get it because he was with Hagel and Suter and that kind of wasn't Kane was with them and that wasn't really generating a lot, but so yeah, I probably wouldn't encourage that, but I guess for right now, because we're kind of stuck with a lot of options or we don't have a lot of options for the second line with Kane. I'm okay with it, but it isn't my first choice. I think he should stick to the third and fourth line. I'm yeah. really curious as to where that's going to go um, these next yeah. couple games. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say the same. I mean, I'm curious where he'll, he'll end up throughout the lineup. I mean, he could be shuffled like everyone else throughout this, uh, throughout this team this year. Uh, Brooke, I got a simple one for you. And I'm curious what your take is. 
Do you think this spark from Henestrosa is just because he's on, he's back to his hometown here, he's playing on a, a fresh new team with a fresh start and he's energized, or do you think he can sustain this kind of production? Yeah, I do think he can sustain it because I do think, like I said before, that it is a lot of mentality. He's got a new start, he's playing for a new contract. And it's his hometown team. So I think that should give him incentive to play like this every night. The way he plays, he plays a lot like Hagel, you know, that kind of feisty, fast game. And so Hagel's been able to sustain that. I think he can, too. I think everyone can, to be honest with you, if you just kind of play your game and stick to what works. And obviously that works for him. So I do think he could sustain that. I hope he kind of keeps that fire lit under him. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I mean, it's, it's been a nice fire to watch and it's been great to see his reunion with, with the Blackhawks. So uh, on that note, I mean, you know, let's talk about whether Hinnestrode is, is here to stay or not. Uh, Brooks alluded to it a couple of times that the 27 year old is uh, going to be ending his term, his current term at the end of this campaign, which means he'll be an unrestricted free agent in this off season. Uh, five points in six games. He's doing everything right. He's playing with the right players. He's making an impact. Um, so I'm, I'm curious to see what you guys think and if he does have a fit here moving forward or if this is just a, you know, more of a, I don't want to call it a rental because, you know, we don't think that the Hawks are necessarily contenders, but is this a short-term player or are the Hawks looking to sign him longer term? If you were in their position, what would you be doing with him in the off season? And if you were going to sign him, what kind of a deal would you like to sign him to, Greg? I know we're in the Vinny Hinnestrosa love fest right now, but we got to be smart with this here. Uh, you know, I, I put out on Twitter last night, I don't know who this guy is in Vinny Hinnestrosa's uniform right now, but I like him. Uh, I'm going big picture this is a small sample size he's been excellent and i'm happy for him he's a good kid and I'm, I'm glad he's back and being successful but big picture when you look at his career outside of one year with the coyotes he's been a fringe nhler his whole career he's a guy he's a guy who's hot right now but he's overall he's a guy you don't at 27 i don't think you really all of a sudden become a superstar but i don't think anybody thinks he's a superstar so I don't know if I bring him back. If I do, it's going to be on the same type of deal, a one year league minimum million dollar contract. You've got too many young players. You got to wrap up here in the next year or two that are going to be coming off the uh, entry level deals. You got to play it smart and, and, and giving Vinny a two, three year deal at 6 million total just isn't a smart contract right now. So I'm not ready to say, yes, he's part of the rebuilding core. Um, let, let the year play out, see where we're at, and then give them one of those one-year kind of prove-it deals and, and take it from there. Yeah, no, good point for sure. Gail, do you agree or are we letting him walk? Um, you know, I actually think that Hinnestrosa could very easily become a really nice complimentary veteran piece for this team. Um, I don't think he'll get in the way of the youngsters. Uh, you can't all be kids. Um, and so I think that he could be kind of a nice balanced player. Um, you know, he, he's got speed, he has playmaking abilities and that what we've seen in the last couple of games, that's come in really handy. And I think that he really likes being in Chicago. So, um, I would not be, um, unhappy if he were to, uh, stay with the Blackhawks and get re-signed. That being said, I would, I would have to say the same thing. It would, it would, you know, Stan likes his short-term deals. So he would have to agree to, to, you know, another 1 million, 1.5 and probably just one year. Brooke, we keeping him for a year or we let him go? Yeah, I'm keeping him. I honestly am kind of sick of our bottom six, to be honest with you. It's just been a revolving door of just a lot of nothing. And I'm okay with him coming back. We'll see if he can continue on with this, but I would keep him, but it would be short. It would be like one year, um, one million, or maybe even 950 grand for two years. I don't know, but either that one or two years. Um, prove it deal kind of type thing and see what he can do. If not, then you can either trade him or let him go if he's on a team friendly deal like that. Yeah, not much debate here. I mean, I, I think we all agree that it's been nice to see his resurgence come back and get some points on the board and find a nice fit through his team through the, the stretch here. But um, he, you know, he hasn't really proven much in, in recent years. Uh, as Greg alluded to, he had his best season in Arizona um, and he kind of went downhill from there. So uh, it's nice to see him kind of picking things back up where he left off, but it, it's just not enough to prove. Um, him being worth much more than what he's currently on. So unfortunately, not much debate or banter here, but I think collectively we're going to all agree that uh, sure, bring him back, why not kind of situation for one year, maybe give him a million, just see, see how it pans out. I think we can all agree with, uh, with that spend. Yeah. Speaking of agreeing with things, let's see uh, how our scouting reports came to fruition. I, I tasked you all with uh, taking a look at an individual team that each of us can look at who the Blackhawks will be playing down the stretch. The conclusion of their season is about a month away. Their Blackhawks last game is scheduled for May 10th. 
They're done with the Blue Jackets. They're done with the Red Wings. And they have a one-off against the Lightning. The remaining games are more mini sets. They'll be playing the Predators, Panthers, Hurricanes, and Stars. And they're not yet out of the playoff picture. So again, all of you were, were tasked with one team to do a little bit of research. And what I want to do is go across the board here and see if we can figure out one weakness that the Blackhawks can expose in their opponent and one strength that the Blackhawks need to contain of that opponent. Gail, you had the Panthers. What are you thinking? Yeah, yeah. I drew uh, Joel Quenville's squad, the Florida Panthers, whom uh, the Blackhawks play on April 29th and May 1st. So those are their last two games. Um, the Panthers beat them the first four contests, and then the Blackhawks were able to beat the Panthers the, the second two. Um, so <laughs> this might sound really oversimplified, but I think that uh, a, a good concept here would be to keep the Panthers from scoring. Um, in the first four games, they outscored the Blackhawks 20 to 11. That's a lot of goals. Um, but then when the Blackhawks won, they outscored um, the Panthers six to two. So, and a three, three zero shutout, which I believe was Subban, right? That's the second, his second one was this last week. Um, so if, getting to this next, okay, the, 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 the positives for the Panthers I just want to say that anybody that um, covers the Panthers, they have got their work cut out for them because they have some really complicated names, especially when it comes to spelling them all, <laughs> as I was looking at all this. But anyway, okay, so the three highest producers, we have Alexander Barkoff, three goals and three assists with the Black, against the Blackhawks. Uh, Carter Verhage, four goals, three assists. And Jonathan Huberto, I don't even know if I'm saying that right. I think I am. Yeah. Um, with one goal and six assists. So just one goal, but, you know, six helpers. Um, so obviously you want to be containing these three players. These are also your top three players from the Panthers. So um, they're pretty consistent there. But on the other hand, we have a couple people that have, uh, Blackhawks that have done well against uh, the Panthers. Dominic Kubelik, three goals, three assists. Brandon Hagel, um, of his six goals, three of them are against the Panthers. You got two rookies in uh, Philip Kurashev and Pia Suter that have gotten two goals against the Panthers. And then, you know, there's always Patrick Kane, three goals and five assists against this team. So these guys are all going to be wanting continuing their success that they've had um, with their goal scoring. And lastly, I think that we should remember we have Vinny Nostroza, Brett Connolly, and Riley Stillman, who all came from the Panthers and are going to want to have something to prove by, um, you know, getting some revenge on their, on their old team. So um, lots of motivation there and two games at the United Center, which is where the Blackhawks won their last two games as well. So hopefully some home cooking will be helpful. Yeah, great points. Getting those past Panthers could be a great wild card because like you said, they might want to get out there and uh, prove themselves and, and prove to their former team that they should have never let them go. So that could definitely work in the Blackhawks advantage. Brooke, what are you uh, thinking for the Hurricanes? What's a weakness that the Blackhawks can expose and a strength that they need to contain? Tough well, I do think that uh, the Hurricanes are a very strong Stanley Cup contender. They're strong in basically every area. They got a great power play. They got a good penalty kill. I think eight of their uh, players on their roster have 20 or more points, which is really freaking good. And it's it, it really is kind of hard to find a weakness there. Now that they got Peter Morazic back in goaltending, they don't have Reimer, who can be kind of shaky. But I will say that the last few times we've played them, they have looked kind of self-destructive. Um, it's been really kind of back and forth with the games when they faced the Hawks. It was like, they scored, then we scored. Then they scored, then we scored. So, like, for example, I think one of the last games was they were up, the Hurricanes were up 2 to nothing. then we tie it at 2-2. Two, two. Um, and then they scored again, and then we tied it again at three. And that, like, they just seem to get kind of rattled, the Hurricanes do, after, like, one mistake. So, I do think that the key is to just pressure them, play hard, pressure them into making mistakes, because once you put them in a corner, they are going to make a mistake, and it could work out for us. Yeah, it's a great tip. I mean, putting pressure on the teams that are usually the ones who are the ones putting pressure on their opponents is obviously a great strategy to throw them off their, uh, off their game. Greg, Dallas Stars, are they still scary, or can we uh, not worry about them as much anymore? I don't know anymore. <laughs> I'm, I'm so confused by this team for, you know, I was on here coming on here saying, Hey, we can't write them off. We can't write them off. And then they, they were terrible for a few games there. And then they say, you know, we, we know that Bishop uh, Bishop and uh, Radulov aren't coming back for the regular season. Uh, two huge pieces right there. They still haven't had Sagan. They are still holding out hope for him. They don't make any moves at the trade deadline. Um, so I'm thinking, yeah, they're done. And now you look at the standings and there's just one point behind the Blackhawks. Spoiler alert, we'll have more on that later. But 
I don't know anymore with these guys. On paper, they should be the fourth playoff team. They have the most talent on paper, but that doesn't always translate into actual wins. But they've been playing better of late. They've got some young guys that are coming up. They are a fast team, which the Blackhawks tend to have problems against traditionally. They've been a little better because you know, the Hurricanes are a very fast team too, and they've had some. They've been competitive against them for the most part. Uh, the keys to success are going to be in these couple games they got left with the Stars. It's got they got to stay out of the penalty box. Stars are just outside the top five on the power play. They got very good power play they will kill you they they have the kind of power play that the blackhawks used to have back in the good old days of february um so stay out of the box and uh if you can get to overtime against them you're going to be in pretty good shape because the dallas stars are 0 and 12 in games in overtime this year they are yeah and, and you look at the standings if they go 500 in overtime they've got a three-point lead on the predators right now so get the game the overtime don't st- don't go to the penalty box. I think you got a good chance uh, to beat them. Yeah, I mean, great tips, obviously. And, uh, you know, avoiding the penalty box is uh, even more important because this Dallas team is, is just dangerous on the point. Like you said, Greg, uh, that's where the Blackhawks used to be, never mind in February, but in years past. But that Dallas team has some options on the blue line, and, and they can really wire a puck up in that. So definitely stay out of the box. Um, I tasked myself with the Predators, which is no coincidence because I hate the Predators if you're just tuning in. Um, but, you know, looking at this team – it's actually pretty simple, which most of our tips are when it comes to simple hockey. This Predators team has somehow found a way to control the Blackhawks the entire season thus far through five games. They've beaten them every single time. The Hawks have only earned two points out of a possible 10, so clearly things are not going their way. But when you break down these games, it's, it, there's not really a lot to look at as far as what might be going wrong other than a couple key facts. And the one that I noticed was an interesting trend was that Nashville in four of those five games scored first. And that was actually their last four games in a row. Once they scored first, they basically never looked back. So I think simply stated, the Hawks need to come out with a little bit more energy than they have been. I don't know why they've looked so stale against this Predators team because they are, they always have been a rival. So I don't know why this year would be any difference. But if this Blackhawks team can come out with a little bit more energy and a little bit more pace to their game and just bring it to the Predators and not let them score first and wire pucks at that net and make sure that theirs goes in, who knows what kind of fate they'll see because we haven't seen that happen yet. And on top of that, the Predators have one of the worst penalty kills in the entire league. I know the Hawks do too, but the Hawks can expose that. If they can get pucks on net, they can expose that. So like I said, get some shots out there, see what goes in, get the early lead, expose them on the penalty kill, and we'll see what happens. And, you know, these are three big games coming up, so they need to be playing with as much energy as they can, and hopefully that will translate into better starts. Friendly mid-show reminder to make sure you – sorry, Greg, go ahead. No, no, no. I'm just saying these are the last three games against the Predators, so they got to – it's now or never. You you you, uh, you you tank these three games and you know um, it's pretty much over. You're not catching. Yeah, the energy got the energy has to be there from from puck drop. So that's the, the, as simple as that. Get pucks on net, yeah. score. And they've had and, they've had issues with that lately. You know those, those two first periods. And they and stink. <laughs> and Nashville stinks. Sorry, just have to get that in there. <laughs> pronouns, pronouns. We gotta know which one you're talking about. Um, Sorry, Nashville yeah, stinks, the, not us. They, uh, the the first period has been trouble lately i mean both of those first periods in detroit were pretty ugly um so as you said it nail on the head you know gotta gotta start fast or or they're gonna clog up the neutral zone and we're gonna fall asleep and they're gonna lose simple hockey and sometimes it works friendly mitchell reminder to make sure you're subscribed and following us across social media you can also find out all of our our author pages to see everything we're publishing at the hockey writers in the description below Let's look back to the trade deadline. I know we touched on it last show a little bit, but um, with the dust settling from the deadline, I want to take a look back at at, uh, one of the most active teams throughout the entire uh, span of that, which was the Chicago Blackhawks. Uh, All signs point to Bowman having done a terrific job of exactly what this team needed him to do. He extracted value from players that were otherwise going to walk, and he picked up picks and prospects along the way. However, there are still some players that remain that you know, we collectively probably could have made a case to, to trade and at least get something out of in the meantime. Uh, with that in mind, what active Blackhawk would you have preferred was dealt at the deadline? Sell us on who you would choose and what the return could have been. Brooke? Well, actually, for Bowman, I think basically everyone that we said should get traded, like Jan, Mark, and Soderberg, actually ended up getting traded. So in that sense, Bowman did a good job. But if we're thinking of someone, I my first thought was Strom. And I know that might be kind of an unpopular 
choice, but I have such an iffy feeling about that guy. I don't really know if he's um, has a solid um, position here. I, it's like, he's just very hot and cold. He can like, when he's hot, he is noticeable. And then when he's not, he's just invisible. And it seems like he isn't making a dent. So I don't know. I feel like he was having a pretty good stretch there before the trade deadline. I think um, because he is a prospect with potential, we probably could have gotten a draft pick or a prospect in return for him. So I actually wouldn't have minded. And so I think that was maybe a candidate, but like I said, I don't know if he has a future here or not, which is why I kind of said that. Yeah, it'll be interesting interesting to see how his play translates because you're right, a little bit of a roller coaster so far. So we'll see if he can how he ends this season and, and perhaps how he starts next year if he is still around. Uh, Greg, anyone on the roster currently that you uh, would have made a deal for? Well, I know everybody thinks I'm going to say Nikita Zadorov, but uh, you know that no, I'm not going to go that route. Granted, what I love to see him be traded, sure. Re, you know, reports were that there were offers and Stan didn't take them. So obviously he has set a value that he wants for him and he didn't get it. So he moved on and I'm okay with that. He's an RFA at the end of the season. So he still has control. Another, if he's looking to trade him, he can maybe get that full value at the draft when things can be discussed more. So I'm okay with that at not, at the moment. Uh, the guy I'm kind of surprised didn't get traded would be uh, uh, Ryan Carpenter. He's another one of those guys like, Soderberg and Yanmark, veteran guy. He's the perfect guy on a fourth line for a Stanley Cup contender. He's a Swiss Army knife type player, can play up and down the lineup, kill penalties. We've even, heck, we've even seen him on the power play this year, um, standing in front of the net. So I was kind of surprised he didn't move. He could have been another guy that could have got, you know, a third or fourth rounder back. Maybe the fact that he's got another year on his contract is why he didn't get traded. I mean, granted, it's only for a million bucks. It's not you know, it's Vinny Henestrosa money. So um, I was kind of surprised he didn't get moved, um, but I guess you can't trade everybody. You know, there's only so many people looking for guys. So I'm not saying he wasn't available, but, you know, maybe the phone didn't ring on Ryan Carpenter. So that'd be really the only other tr- player I would have uh, actively looked to move. Yeah, good point. And just like uh, Zadorov, perhaps he just didn't get the deal he wanted for Carpenter because Carpenter's a solid pick. I mean, he's had a great year. Um, we've seen more of him. We focus more on him, but I, I totally agree. Great, great pickup for anyone who wants to make a deep run. But again, the return might not have been there. Uh, Gail, anyone on the roster that you would rather have seen go and, and what would you have wanted to get from him? Well, since we're making these picks, I'm, I think I'm going to go with uh, defenseman Calvin DeHaan here. Um, you know, he's 29 years old. He's got a hefty cap hit of 4.55 million for this season and the next. Um, and he's dispensable basically because you do have your, your log jam of younger defensemen, pro- defensive prospects. So, um, and I know that this has been discussed as well. I really do think that he will be one of the players that's exposed for the, uh, Seattle Kraken for the expansion draft. Um, you know, he, he's a steady, consistent, solid defenseman. And I think that he would be an asset to any team, including the Blackhawks. You know, I'm happy that he's still around. Um, but I think that the Blackhawks have put themselves in a good position for, you know, if they were to lose him to still be all right with the, with the defense uh, that we have with the younger, with the younger people coming up. Yeah. I wish I could have added a little bit of uh, more variety to this answer, but, but Gail, you hit every point on the head. I'm going to go with Han as well. Um, I wrote about it leading up to the, the deadline as well, that uh, just his age and his salary, as much as he's a first stop player and he's shown that even in his time in Chicago, he's a solid presence. He plays every area of the game. He can be put into any scenario, but um, that age and that salary, I just don't know that it's conducive to to this rebuild. I think that we could have done more with, even if we retained some of that salary, perhaps we could have gotten some more picks and prospects. And I know that's, you know, again, Bowman did a fantastic job. This is more of a question of what else would he have done. So I just would have liked to have seen some of that salary come off the books and maybe have a little bit more in the pipeline of what's to come. Because uh, again, again, Gail, like you said, they're, they're so packed on the blue line. You know, give these kids more of a chance. I know they're, they're all getting a lot of a chance, but give them more. And with the Han out of the picture, they'd have even more of an opportunity to develop. So I'm going to go with Dahan as well on that one. I'll add, I'll add a little note on the Dahan thing, why he probably didn't get traded. I And I'm making the prediction he will be a Seattle Kraken uh, next year because you have to leave a veteran at each position uh, exposed. So if they would have traded Dahan, that guy would have been Connor Murphy. So you would have lost Dahan and Murphy. I don't think anybody really wants to do that. So if you keep Dahan, he gets exposed. You can protect Murphy and then – that salary is off the books as he's playing in Seattle. That's my prediction. Okay. Very fair point, And I hope your prediction is correct for all the reasons noted. 
outside of talking about getting people away from Chicago, I want to turn it to getting people towards Chicago. Let's bring more of the attention towards this fan base. As an original six franchise, this team is far from suffering when it comes to an active and widespread fan base around the world. We know that. Um, we are four of them, but there are millions of us. Um, you know, even through the lack of success this team has been encountering, there is still so many reasons to cheer on this team and, and love everything that, is, that this franchise has to offer. So what I want to do is I want to position a hypothetical. You get a private message on Twitter from someone who's just getting into the sport as they see that you're a loyal fan who's in it for the long haul. They ask why they should choose Chicago as their team too. What's one aspect of this franchise that you focus on to convince them? Gail? Yeah? Okay, so I'm going to have a really hard time with just one aspect as being, you know, a, a long-time Chicago Blackhawks fan. Um, you know, there's, there's their, their original six pedigree. There's their history with Stanley Cups. Um, not to mention the fact that, you know, you can watch Patrick Kane on a nightly basis, one of the best players in the world. Um, those are really three things. But if you really had to sell me, if I really had to sell somebody, um, I would go with the fact that this is just a young team um, and the future looks bright for them. You know, they've been struggling content, content for a while. They finally committed to this rebuild and they're progressing faster than any of us expected. And that's really exciting. You know, you've got a new young core now. You've got Alex DeBrinket, you've got Dominic Kubali, Kirby Da, um, defenseman Connor Murphy, I think we can put into that core at this point. Um, you've got other young players, Dylan Strom. Well, we'll see about Dylan Strom because I think I might agree with Brooke a little bit there. Um, uh, Pia Suter, Philip Kurashev, even Brandon Hagel, you know, defensemen, Adam Boquist, uh, Ian Mitchell, Nicholas Bodan, uh, Wyatt Kalanuk. I mean, these are all on the cusp players that are really exciting. And it's so cool to watch them learn and grow and develop like right in front of our very eyes. We're seeing a lot of superstars. So to me, that would be why, because the future looks bright and exciting. The future definitely looks bright and exciting. And what's cool about that young core that you named off is they're already performing. So it, it, to me, it, as, an, as an already converted fan, I can't wait to see what they do next. Uh, Brooke, how are you convincing a, a potential new fan to come on board with the Blackhawks? Um, I would say history. I think um, when you look at their history, it's just so rich. I mean, they've had some of the best um, players in NHL history on their team with players like Stan Makita and Tony Esposito. And the Blackhawks just did a thing about remember the roar for the Chicago Stadium and stuff like that. Like that was one of the best arenas in the country. And it's something that means so much to the players in the city. And then also, just the fact that they're an original six and the fact that they started, you know, the goal horn and goal song tradition, I the, the history goes on and on with this team, which is why I think makes it so special to root for. So I would definitely say the history of this team is what makes it so special and why you should root for them. Yeah, great reasons all around. I mean, obviously, this, this franchise has been part of the fabric of this league since it's, since it's been developed. So great reasons all around for sure. Greg, what are you uh, saying to a potential fan to get them on board here? Um, I'm going to surprise a lot of people. The guy that writes the Today in Hockey History column is also going to stay. The, the, the most attractive thing to me is the history of this franchise. Yes, as Gail uh, correctly said, the future looks pretty good right now, but I'll go the opposite and say the history. This is a team that there's so many stories. So if you want to become a fan now, you can literally spend years just learning about the players and the history of the franchise. There are so many things that are just fabrics of this game, this league that started because of the Blackhawks or things like that. And, you know, you, you can, sure, like a team like Vegas, look, they're fun, they're good right now, but they've been around three years. Where's the history? Where's the fun? They, none of their players are even their guys. You know, they all came from somewhere else. Their best players in franchise history, you know, their, their Twitter's fun. Is that why you like them? I don't know. The his I love history. There's so many great stories. There's so many those fun things I can go on for hours telling stories about just funky little things that happen in a Blackhawk game. And you know, it's the fandom is passed down from generation to generation in this city. You don't see that very often. I love the Blackhawks because my parents love the Blackhawks. My parents were season ticket holders in the '70s. They took me to games as a small child at the Chicago Stadium. You know, the, the, the first person I called when the Hawks won in 2010 was my dad. You know, you share things like that. You know, when my dad passed away, I put the ticket stub of the last game we were together with him in his casket. 
because it just it was so special. You don't get that with a team that's been around for five years, 10 years, 20 years. So it's the multi-generational history, the stories. To me, I just love that. I can I can talk about that all night. I mean, all great reasons, obviously. And, and uh, interestingly enough, I'm a Blackhawks fan because of my dad as well. So um, as, as some of our viewers know, I live in Toronto, but uh, my dad made sure that it was never a Go Leafs Go household as, as, as long as he was the one controlling the controller. So it was always a Go Hawks Go every time he had a chance and that it's hard not to jump on board when that's happening. Uh, and I'm, I'm more than happy that it did because now I get to cheer for both, but just don't tell my dad. <laughs> um, on that note, I, you know, mine's, mine's a hybrid mix of both. I mean, obviously the history is rich. We know that and, and the future looks bright. For me, I, I've said this even on this show and I've said it all along to, to people who I talk to about this team, um, even before their, their dynasty of the 2010s, this team has always been one that's just been out there to compete. There's such a pride that goes into these athletes putting on that sweater and it's obvious. They always come out to battle. They always come out to play and there's just a passion that's unmatched. Sure, they have bad games, they have rough plays, they have bad stretches. We know all that. That happens. It's normal. But the reality is, this is a franchise who's an original six team. They've only ever had one first overall pick, and that's because they won the draft lottery that year. And that pick was Patrick Kane. The point I'm making here is this team has never done enough to tank, which is so common in this day and age, to get a better draft pick because they always want to go out there and fight. No matter what is thrown at these players, when they have that jersey on, they get out there with passion and they play. For someone who wants to come in and love this sport, how can you not love a team that represents the epitome of everything that they should when it comes to competing in the best team in the world? They play with passion, they play with fire, and they want to win. Simple. This is the franchise that will never let up, no matter what position they're in. Even now, they're fighting for a playoff spot when we all basically predicted that they would be far from it. They have no quit. And any new fan should recognize that and jump on board because they're a fun team to watch, win or lose. Speaking of winning or losing, let's look at the week ahead. The Blackhawks have climbed back to being only two points behind the Predators for fourth in the Central Division with a game in hand. Chicago and Nashville, as we've said, will face off in a three-game series on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, in which could be one of the most pivotal series that they have all season, if not the most pivotal to determine their fate, uh, whether they'll get a playoff berth or not. At the same time, as we alluded to, Dallas is now only one point back of Chicago with two games in hand on the Hawks, and they actually play Detroit four times this week. There are a lot of playoff implications that will come to fruition by the end of of this week and by the time we record our next show. So we'll keep this prediction pretty straightforward. Who do you see sitting in fourth, fifth, and sixth place respectively in the central standings by the end of this week? Brooke? I'm going to say Blackhawks, Stars, Preds. Greg. Detroit, yeah. Uh, I'm going to think the Predators are going to stay in fourth and the Stars will jump ahead of the Blackhawks for fifth. The Hawks will fall down. Yeah. All right. You know what? I'm tired of being realistic because that breeds negativity. So positive mindset. We're going places, darn it. We're going places. Blackhawks can do this. Fourth place of Blackhawks. Dallas Stars are going to be fifth place. And you want to know what? Go Red Wings. I don't care. Go Red Wings, right? For Dallas. And those Predators are going down. Sixth place. Well, three to one, Greg, because I got fourth Chicago, fifth Dallas, and sixth Nashville. <laughs> oh. Let's hope majority rules on that one. Yeah. <laughs> I'll be happy to be wrong, but until the Blackhawks actually beat the Predators, I expect them to lose. Well, it'll happen Monday night. All right. <laughs> it is coming, Greg. <laughs> All right. All right. As I said, I'll be glad to be wrong. Well, hopefully next week we can all say how wrong Greg was. And on that note, that will do it for another episode of Blackhawks Banter. Thank you to Greg, Gale, and Brooke for joining me. And a special shout out to all of you for tuning in. We really appreciate it. Please be sure to subscribe, like, and follow to stay up to date on all things Blackhawks. And feel free to connect with each of us along the way too. Take care, folks. <laughs>